Well, hello again, everybody. It's me, Pastor Dennis. I want to give everybody a hello. Thank you for being a part of Bible study, allowing us to be a part of your spiritual development. It's very important to us that you grow spiritually and you nurture and grow the, the leadership that God has given unto you. And as we're continuing in our Bible study lesson um, called The King and His Caves, we're looking at the three caves that David was in where he experienced some life-changing events. And from these caves, we're gonna extract some leadership qualities that I feel personally that God requires every leader to have. And um, last week we talked about the cave when David was in Abdullah, where he learned that, you know, you have to make people better. The people that came to him were people that were in debt, that were discontented and they weren't in a good place. But, you know, further down the line in the, in the book of Chronicles, the Bible said that these same men were David's men of valor that so that David bettered them. And we want to make sure as leaders, doesn't matter what capacity you are, you could be a mother, a father, you know, a sister, a brother, you have a lead, leadership is influence. And all of us are influential in our own rights that whenever we step in, step into a place or whoever is around us, we make them better. We make them better. That's what God has called us to be. People who make people better. Sometimes in ministry, you only focus on making people's situations better. And that's good. But the true blessing you could give to any individual is that, make it, is that you make them better. Because sometimes their situations are what they are because of who they are. But if, the, if you could truly be a co-laborer with God in terms of building people, because everybody has a divine destination in God, and God is building them to become a person who he preordained them to be, as long as you put your hand on the pulse of God and grow in spirituality and begin to mentor and nurture people, that is the purest form of co-laborship with God, being a co-laborer with them that you're building people and bettering people, not only trying to make them happy, not only trying to see to their situations and making the situations better, but you make them better as a person. And that's the best quality of leadership you can actually demonstrate. And tonight we wanna talk about honor. Honor is important. A lot of times I, I hear the language in our generation of Christianity and, um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, I do hear a tone of, of a lack of honor. And I want to just um, use this um, cave situation that David went through to emphasize the importance as a leader that you know what honor is. Honor towards you and honor towards anybody else. A leader has to be a person that recognizes honor. Always, and as a person, as, as, as a person that is just as a Christian, as a believer, you have to be a person of honor. Honor, it's a major thing. We're going to unearth that that principle today, tonight. I'm going to ask you just to open your Bibles to um First Samuel, chapter twenty four. First Samuel chapter twenty four, and I'm going to read it out. And I apologize, this is going to be a length some read. It's going to be from verse 1 to 15. And I'm going to be reading from the King James Bible. But tonight, you will be blessed. We're going to talk about this topic like you've never heard it before. I promise you that. You know, Pastor Dennis reads the Bible and understands it a little bit different from others. It's always based upon how the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. But I, I, I rest, I, I trust that you will be blessed from this. Amen. So 1 Samuel chapter 24 verses 1 to 15, and it reads, and it came to pass when Saul was returned from the following, from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Dave, behold, David is in the wilderness of Engidi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel, 3,000 chosen men to catch one guy with a bunch of misfits, gosh, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, 
where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, meaning that he went to see to his needs, or where some interpretation says that he went to relieve himself. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mightest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt or robe. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, that the Lord's anointed to stretch forth thine hand, mine hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth, still showing Saul honor, and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words say, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into my hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, moreover, my father, see, yea, the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I cut off thy, the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. I have not sinned against thee, yet thou hunteth my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee. But my hand shall not be upon thee as said the proverb of, ancient, of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. I'm going to ask everybody, because it's customary for me just to pray before I minister. So I'm just going to ask everybody just to bow your heads. Father, I thank you tonight. We believe tonight that your word will be made perfect in converting our soul. We pray tonight that you will, dear Lord God, elevate our leadership at a higher level. Tonight, we will know the blessings that will be would that would be bestowed upon us if we know the importance of honor and that despite whatever the vision despite whatever the dream of the destined place that you have granted unto us we will not go there without honor as our mantle we will always go through the route that shows the greatest level of ethics O oh lord god that we will be integral and as david had the opportunity to dear Lord God, be somebody who he didn't want to be. He chose to be an honorable person as a leader. So we pray tonight, whatever capacity of leadership that you have given unto us, be it within our homes, be it within the workplace, or even in ministry, we will know the importance of honor because you chose us and called us to that level of leadership. And we believe it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, tonight, guys, our, our theme tonight in, in leadership is honor. And I'm a man of honor. I believe honor is important. And I'm, I'm going to teach tonight from my heart because I believe that every blessing that God has bestowed upon my life and on your life, it will come from a place of honor. God does honor people who honor him. 
God honors people who honors him. And as believers, we cannot just only just honor God. We have to also honor people. And we have to also the offices that God has allowed to be existing here on earth. Now, I know tonight when I speak about honor, without a shadow of doubt in my mind, I'm going to probably disturb our New Age Christianity mindset. Because sometimes we believe that we're only supposed to honor God and a man is just a man and a person is just a person. I want to let you know that is not so. That is not so. In, these ser in this series where we talk about, you know, a king in his caves, we're looking at the three cave experiences that David had in his life and that these three cave experiences were monumental to him. They showed him the importance of leadership. And I want to let you know that if you are a leader, you have to acknowledge honor. David is anointed as king. And yet still God has given him the vision that he would be king. But he would not obtain that throne from a place that shows a low level of honor. David is in a cave where Saul went into to go relieve himself. He had an opportunity to take Saul's life, but he acknowledged the office of Saul and the anointing that was on Saul's life, though some of us still preach and teach that it, it has now left Saul. But in David's eyes, he still has to acknowledge the office. Sometimes in your Christian life, we have to you know, embrace the fact that office is important. Titles are important. Don't say being a pastor, being an apostle, being an evangelist, being a teacher, they are not important. They are important. We have no right to disrespect what Christ, where according to the book of Ephesians has declared, had went down to hell and bring back up to us. They are important. You should respect, even if you're not in good standing with the person, you still must respect the office. You must still respect the office. And I know in our modern day and age, that's not fancy. It's not really accepted. We think it's not necessary. It is. The Bible says, and I'm going to go to the Old Testament, as Old Testament for it as well. But I believe the principles still remain. That in Numbers chapter 12 to 15, please, because I care about you, write that down. Numbers chapter 12, all the way down to chapter 15. It's a story of three siblings. One is named Aaron. One is named Moses. One is named Miriam. That mother who birthed those three children must have had a blessed house. Because right there in Aaron, we have the ministry of the first priest. Miriam, as, as church history likes to say and teach, which I accept as well, Miriam is the first worship leader. Moses, the first prophet. What a blessed womb she had. Those two siblings, Aaron and Miriam, had something against Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman who was a woman of a different color, a different ethnicity, and they, they had something against it. They showed dishonor to the man of God. The Bible said that God heard their dishonor. Write this simple thing down. I'm going to speak from my heart because I want you guys to have a blessing. Because you'll never hear anything else in scripture or see anything else in scripture that, scripture that took place here. God heard them when they were showing God, Moses dishonor. Always remember, when you sh show dishonor or speak dishonor, though the person may not hear it, God still hears it. And your life will reap the results of it. The Bible said that God told Moses now to tell your two siblings to meet me at the tabernacle. Tell them to come and meet me at the tabernacle. This is something that you never saw in scripture. Because when you go into the tabernacle of Moses, there is the outer court. 
We're talking about how God sees dishonor before we get into this teaching. Because I want you to establish this mindset before I begin to teach. When you go into the tabernacle of Moses, there is the outer court. Then there is an inner court. And then there is the holy place where there is the table of showbread, the candlesticks, and the incense of smoke. It is the place for the priest's operating function. And then there is the most holy place. I know November and Kingsway is worship month. We're not supposed to be getting into that now. But we need to see how God sees this honor, not how we see it with our carnality and our earthly frame of thinking. You have to, if you don't respect the person, you still have to respect the office. When Notice when God says this. How dare you speak to Moses like that? You tell them to come to the tabernacle. When he says that, when he tells them to come to the, the tabernacle, God in the tabernacle stays in the most holy place behind the veil. This is the first time in scripture you're hearing God say, tell them to come to the tabernacle. I will meet them at the door. I'm going to fix this. When it comes to dishonor, read it in your Bible. It's there. Most of us have this tendency of thinking because we don't read scripture. But this is very important because you will have a stagnant life. And you won't reach into your most destined place if you are a person that lacks honor. Despite the vision God has given David, despite the oil that flowed on his head, if David operated in dishonor, that throne would never be his. And David didn't allow those who were around him. This is why it's important that you have good self-leadership. So you're not easily manipulated by others when you yourself know better. There's never a time where you see in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, where God says, don't worry about the outer and inner court things. And I'm going to step out from behind this veil. You tell them to come to the tabernacle. I personally will meet them at the door. And God looks at Miriam and looks at Aaron and says, who do you think you are? If there was ever a prophet in this nation, I will speak to them through dreams and visions. Like how some of us have it today. God gives you a vision of a purple polka dot cow eating yellow grass. And you're trying to use typology to figure out what God is saying out of that. God is saying, I speak to Moses with open speech. He is not an average person. And I've learned in my life with understanding that scripture to know that, that the hint of dishonor, it moved God to even move aside the rules and address it personally to say, listen, tell them to meet me at the tabernacle. Tell the priests, don't show up to work today. They're not going to like what they're going to see. Tell them, I will meet them at the door. Please write down Numbers 12, verse 1, chapter 12 and 15. Read it for yourself. David, a man probably knowing the scriptures, realizes that I'm not going to operate out of dishonor. I'm not going to allow dishonor to allow the blessings of God to not come to fruition in my life. I'm not going to allow a little moment like this, an opportunity like this, to cause me to function in a way that I know that's not pleasing to God. Because despite the vision, despite the dream God has given you, if you go about it in an unethical way, you will abort that blessing. God then now, now how do we now begin to treat dishonor? How does God deal with it? God, look, God says this, okay, Miriam, you don't like Mary, you don't like Moses' wife because she's darker than you. So what I will do, I will give you leprosy. And now your skin is lighter. 
I'm not trying to spook you. And I know we grew up to see God and we read Psalms and say that his mercy endures forever. And he still does. Yes, he does. But sometimes we see things and read things and not care to see it, how God sees it. We apply our own opinion to it. This is how God is dealing with dishonor. Because when you read in Samuel, you have to think, why didn't David do what he could have done? And take old Saul and then boom, the throne is yours. It's sometimes it's not about what you have. It's about what you've done to obtain it. And you cannot exercise good leadership without having honor. Even within your own home, as a parent, you have to be a person of honor or else, or even before you have children, make sure you are a person of honor. Why? Because the Bible said a seed soweth after its own kind. If you are a person that lack honor, what will you think your children will be? God looks at Miriam and says, I will give you leprosy. And now leprosy comes with its own curse. It comes with isolation. He says, now you're singled out outside of the camp for seven whole days. Dishonor will create a stagnancy in your life. Nothing moves. Nothing moves. And the Bible even says that not even the people of Israel, even though they're going to go to their campaign to conquer Kenya, could not even take a step forward. They had to wait for Mary. So the whole mission, the whole assignment, the whole thing that God has led us out of Egypt for is on a standstill because of dishonor. And if you want to put your life in a standstill, you exercise dishonor. I am a pastor, but I do have oversight. I have a pastor above me. In no way and form, I will ever dishonor that person. Because I know what dishonor would, would, would produce. Even in one of the Ten Commandments, it teaches children to honor your mother and father so that your days may be long on earth. David is showing a tremendous level of integrity here. Not allowing people to dictate what he knows what is right. And if you want to be a great leader, if you want to exercise, you know, great leadership, you have to be able to acknowledge honor. And when you exhibit honor, those that are under you will produce the same fruit. You cannot allow the people in the world to dictate to you what you should and shouldn't do in a moment. You know better, always take the high road. You will take the high road. Because even in the natural realm, when you take the highway, you are allowed to move faster. But when you be, decide to dishonor, if you allow yourself to say certain things, a lot of times we, we hear people say like, you know, I respect this person, but, you know, there is no but. And my admonition before, to you, before we get into this teaching, we know how God sees dishonor and how God deals with it. And that is not my prayer for you. I know this is not in, we're not in church right now in Bible study, so I won't be able to hear an amen, but I hope and pray that you are there and you're hearing me and you're saying amen and be in agreement with this, even if you don't like it. It's something worth being in agreement with. Dishonor, dishonor will put your life in a standstill. And how we see, how do we deal with people when we see them? functioning in dishonor. We see that in the book of Numbers chapter 12. God isolates them. Why? Because you have to treat it as if it's leprosy. It's, it's cancerous. It can contaminate the whole body. It allows a whole group of people to stand still. Always remember, when you function in dishonor, it will close the valve of the blessing over your life. And Honor 
is not for the other person. Honor is for you. Honor affects you, not anybody else around you. Even if the person in leadership is not acting honorable, you should and still honor the office. Because you have to respect the work of Jesus Christ. That office exists because Christ went to hell and bring it back up. Those are leadership gifts. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, teacher. I'm not saying the leadership is not is, is above reproach. I'm saying the best route to go about it is to go to the person that's over the leader, and that is to pray to God. Ask God, because they have their own issues as well. They have their own flesh as well. They have their own earthly tendencies as well. They miss the mark as well. The only difference between me and anybody else is my office. I'm a pastor. But I have the same struggles as you and the same inconsistencies as anybody else. I am not above reproach. I am not above reproach. But there are rules to this thing that I realized in scripture. Whereas we could, you know, block the blessing of God. Seven whole days, seven, seven whole days, sorry, seven whole days, Israel was on a standstill because of the act of one person's dishonor. One person's dishonor. So when we look at this text and we see how dishonor works, and I want to say it like this so we understand it. On Monday nights, we have a prayer team and we have impartation. And we're, and we're studying on, we're doing a study on strongholds. Stay with me. Because I want to see this, I want to teach you the spiritual component to this text that we read, what we just read. What is a stronghold? Write this down. And this is Pastor Dennis's definition of a stronghold. It's a mindset with a demonic spirit attached to it. That is what a stronghold is. It is a mindset. It's a way of thinking that it's not truth, but a spirit attached to it, a demonic spirit attached to it. This is what I mean. When we first hear about strongholds, we hear it in the book of, of um, Joshua chapter 6, when they go into Jericho. Jericho is a stronghold. It's a fortified place. The promised land is Israel's, just as the throne belongs to David as well. But to possess the land, they have to go first through Jericho, which is a stronghold. To conquer Jericho, they couldn't just walk in there. They have to break down the stronghold, the thing that is fortifying Jericho, which is the walls. To break a stronghold, you have to break down what is fortifying the place. Now, the mindset, for an example, could be, for example, let's put it this way. Say you have a brother in the church. He sleeps with one sister, which is wrong. Which is wrong. We know that. But it's not necessarily the spirit of lust that is operating. It is just the frailty of his flesh. It is not yet a spirit operating. But always remember, a spirit just like the Holy Spirit, the environment has to be conducive for it, for it to remain there and be comfortable and function. For example, the disciples could have been up in the prayer room praying till a month, but until they were in one accord, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come in. The certain spirits require a certain environment to occupy the space. Now, the one incident with the young man had to sleep with the one sister is one thing. He could have repented from that and got, and got deliverance from it. But if it's a second and a third time and then a fourth time, it could attract the spirit, the actual spirit of lust to say this vessel fits me like a glove. And now the lustful spirit that he may have operating now is now coupled with the literal spirit of lust. 
And now this spirit comes in and then fortifies that habit. And now that habit, that tendency, that mindset has now become a stronghold within that person. Now it's a deception because that's not the way that's supposed we're supposed to live. So how do you break a stronghold? If it's a deception, because we cast it casts our job, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. So even when you look at Jericho, God told Joshua to gather all the men of war, but they weren't going to fight the battle in the way that they thought. The weapons are not going to be carnal. But it's mighty where? Not through sword, but through God. The priests had to go first. And then they had to walk around Jericho with worship. And then the walls fell down. For them to conquer Jericho, they had to break down first what fortified it. Stay with me. Because we're talking about how if we don't deal with dishonor and you stick with it, you will allow the spirit of dishonor to occupy your vessel. But we have to see how strongholds work. I have to sell that to you first before we talk about it. This Bible study won't be long, though we're talking deep things, deep concepts. This is for our prayer team we're talking about, but I'm sharing it with you. So then, now, the spirit now looks at this one man's vessel and says, now this vessel looks like it, it fits me like a glove because the environment is suitable for me just as, as the disciples were in the upper room and when they became in one accord, the Holy Spirit came because one accord is one of the ingredients or the invitations for the Holy Spirit to come. Unity. That's why the Bible says in the book of Psalms that that is the place where God even commands the blessing. You don't need to ask God to bless you if we're unified. He commands the blessing. He commands the blessing. The spirit now looks and said, this vessel is, is, is nice. I could, I could dwell in you. And now all of a sudden, the spirit of lust now is functioning in this young man. It's no longer now his normal, an old or you could say a, a, a missing of the mark or a tendency of his flesh. The spirit is now functioning in it. And the only way to break that is with the truth of God's word. This is why John chapter 17. Read it, write that down. What Jesus said when he was praying for his disciples, sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. For you to break a stronghold, you have to use the word of God as truth. For any imagination that tries to exalt itself over the knowledge or the concept of God, that what we know, how we ought to live, you need truth to break it, which is the word of God. And I'm saying all this just to say that, that you cannot allow dishonor to function in your life to the point that you continue with it. You continue with it. And then you, your vessel, before you see yourself as self, you better see yourself as a vessel. And as a vessel, something will and should, by design, occupy you. You do not want the spirit of dishonor to function in your life. Because you've carried up, you, you've tarried so long in that vein. This is good discipleship teaching. Because some of us are wondering, why does my life look stagnant? Why isn't anything moving? Because you have allowed dishonor to come into your heart and start cause you to say certain things and behave a certain way. And all these things that you probably say in private, God does here. This is why this is the, I am the way I am. I've learned that there is a blessing in honor. And now, just like leprosy, as Marian, Marian was a leper, your skin becomes callous. You have no feeling. Church is moving. The spirit of God is moving. But because you have the spirit of dishonor in you now, you can't move. 
You don't even sense God anymore. You don't even want to go to church anymore. You don't even want to read your Bible no more. You're wondering why? Because there was some moment in your life where you allowed dishonor to dictate what you say, how you conduct yourself amongst people, and how you see a certain person who is above you. And now you can't receive from God. You have allowed your whole life to be stagnant, and you can't lead your life. This is still leadership teaching. You cannot lead your life in that direction. David knew how dangerous dishonor can be, and he would not allow people to allow him to allow his blessed future to spiral downward. And what I've learned from this, this is why Aaron should have known better when Moses was in the mountaintop with the Ten Commandments, making them. Because while he was in the mountaintop getting the word of God, he allowed the people to make him make a golden calf. Saul, even when he was king, they were having a ceremony, and then it was required for the prophet to light the torch of the altar. Him, Saul being a king, wasn't able to do it. He wasn't the right person for the job. But he allowed the people to dictate him, oh, we've been here, standing here, waiting for so long for Samuel, the prophet, to come. So then Saul, King Saul, decided, okay, I'll light it. And Samuel had to rebuke him. What I've learned from these two texts is very simple. Don't allow people to make you do and become a thing that you know better. This is good leadership teaching because you got to lead yourself and not allow people to dictate who you need to be and what you're supposed to be doing to get to the place that God said he will open the door for. I've learned in Christianity that as, as believers, we don't know what we're supposed to do. The Gospels, when you teach about salvation, salvation teaching teaches us what Jesus has already done. When we teach about the kingdom, we are teaching about what you are supposed to be doing. We're in a season right now when I'm amongst believers. I don't teach so much of the salvation gospel. That is what now what you need to know because you're saved. You have already at some point, especially if you're a part of Kingsway, have taken baptismal teaching to know about grace, to know about salvation. And all these things, your struggle in your personal life is that after you have already known what Jesus has, has already done, you don't know what you're supposed to do. What Jesus has already done is done. Even if you know it or not, you are going to experience it and be a recipient of it. But the other half of the blessing in your life that you need to experience hinges off of what, you, what you're supposed to be doing. And if you don't know it, you won't experience those blessings. And one of the things you need to know what you should be doing is be a person of honor. If you want the blessing of God to flow in your life fluently, fluently, be a person of honor. Be a person of honor. Respect God. Respect people. Because people are the pinnacle of God's creation. When it comes to the subject in terms of ministry and how we ought to speak to people, Paul said, who are we to rebuke another man's servant? Who is God? God is the man. The worker is the, is, is the person. We ought not to speak ill of anybody. If you want, there is blessing that comes through honor. But if you allow the spirit of dishonor to occupy your mindset, occupy up here, and definitely occupy up here in your heart. You will be like Miriam, leprous. You'll be all alone. You'll be by yourself. And you will blame other people, saying people don't care. But you, I'm showing you from the scriptures, and sometimes it's not even people. It is God that is orchestrating it. Because when you are a leper, the condition is contagious. How many people, because you don't know the amount of people have allowed other people to spiral downward in their destiny because they've allowed the spirit of dishonor 
to, to cause the spirit to cause to be contagious in other people's lives. And it's contagious. And this is why God isolates the sickness. And if you even go, go even further in the text in Numbers chapter 12, where Moses now, what the Bible says, is the meekest man on earth. Moses says, come on, God. Um, <laughs> this is my sister here. Um, <laughs> can you, uh, you know, relieve her from this curse? Because she is my sister. You know what God says? Oh, I can't wait. We will. I really can't wait till we become a church that reads our Bible. I really can't wait. God says, hey, if she had done that, this is what God said. If she had done that to her earthly father, her earthly father would have probably spit in her face. That's what God said. What I have done was just gave her leprosy. Both situations would have warranted her to be outside of the camp for seven days. I really can't wait till we begin to read our Bibles. And then when you read your Bibles, that is when you know you're God. You see how God operates and how he sees certain things that are probably our new age Christianity will not show us. Because even though it's Old Testament, I promise you, the principles still apply. The principles still apply. You can't believe that because we're in New Testament, God does not still honor offices. He does. God still honors people. And you can't just say any and anything. Only good could come in your life if you just always show honor. Don't even try to dishonor anybody. Even if they wronged you. What did David say in the text? God will, God will judge between you and me. And God will be my vindicator. David will not take matters into his own hand. He will continue to take the high road. And my, my prayer and my admonition to you tonight in this Bible study and in this cave experience that David experienced is that, hey, be an honorable person. Show honor. Respect others. Regardless what they have done. You've heard me say it before that when people show you wickedness, you dare not try to get even on them with them because you will never get even with them. It costs them nothing to do wickedness, but it could cost you a lot. First, it will cause you to become a person who you're not trying to be. Your mindset and your aim should be like Christ. For you to get even, you're going to have to be like them. This is why David said the ancient proverb, wickedness only comes from wicked people. And if somebody gives you wickedness or shows you wickedness, you're going to have to be wicked then to get even with them. This is why God delivers us from that action and says that vengeance belongeth unto me. I will do that. You continue to be you and do you for you. Because honor is for you. Honor is like forgiveness. It is for you. But the longer you stay in, in dishonor, you're making your vessel attractive to the literal spirit of dishonor. And then now he comes inside you. And now he makes, as the Bible puts it, your body his house. And he stays there. And now it's no longer you operating in the spirit of dishonor. It is now the spirit of dishonor in the driver's seat. And now you begin to dishonor everybody. You begin to dishonor everybody. And what you become now, a person who you, God never intended you to be. And you're robbing yourself of the blessings of God in your life. You're not sensitive to the things of God anymore. You're like Miriam in that seven-day leprous state where your skin is callous, no feeling. You don't sense God, no nothing. Everybody in church, happy-go-lucky, and you're there in your miserable state thinking nobody can, because it's affecting you. It's a you situation. And the only way you could deliver yourself out of that is through breaking down like Jericho the thing that fortifies the place. You have to break down the wall. 
because you can't deal with the dishonor mindset because now you have allowed the, the spirit of dishonor to operate. For you to break it now, you can't deal with the mindset. You have to tackle the spirit because that's the wall. You, you can't enter into Jericho until you break the wall. <laughs> what makes Jericho fortified is the wall. And they could never conquer Jericho until the walls come down. And you can never di directly break that mindset of dishonor until you break down the thing that is fortifying it, which is the literal spirit of dishonor. Hello, people. You just made the job a lot harder. That's not true, Pastor Dennis. We could deliver it with, with just the name of Jesus Christ. You think that's how it goes? The Bible said there was a village that had diseased people, sick people. And Jesus himself could not do no miracles there because they did not believe, which is a form of dishonor. It's not that Jesus couldn't do it. Dishonor halts the anointing. My pastor is a great guy, but at the day I dishonor him, the anointing that flows from him to me will halt. Because sometimes the anointing has a mind of its own. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. She got her deliverance without Jesus' without he, didn't even have Jesus' consent. She applied spiritual principles. She touched the hem of his garment. Where in the book of Malachi says that when the Messiah comes, there will be healing in his wings. That's how they spoke in the olden day. Healing in his wings is literally the hem of the garment. So when she said within herself, if this is really the Messiah, then if I can only touch the hem of his garment, then I could deal with this issue. She wasn't jumping off a cliff with faith. She was literally using the word. And her deliverance came to fruition. There is rules to this thing. This is why the book of James says, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you still don't have it. Why? Because you ask amiss. In the Greek, amiss means outside of the pattern. There are certain blessings you will not have because you have allowed dishonor to be your pillow. And for us to be a people to have what God desires us to have, what David learned in that cave, we have learned now tonight that we have to be a people of honor. What would you think would happen if David actually killed Saul while he was still functioning in that office? What would you think would have happened? Saul was king. He wasn't a prophet, but Saul did prophesy, the Bible said. But when he needed something to know something, well, needed to know something from a spiritual place, he should have went to a prophet. The Bible said even then, the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. Saul was anointed king. But the moment he went outside of that and decided to go use mediums, the kingdom was rent from him. That is how Saul lost the kingdom. Now, actually, that's how Saul lost his life. Because when you go a different route than what was really given to us, you show dishonor to God. And the fact that Saul went to mediums, rather they go on the route that God has legislated for kings to go. He lost his life. It wasn't only because of sin. Read your Bible. David did more sin than Saul. How come the kingdom wasn't rent from him? Because David was a man that honored God. There is a grace that comes over your life. When you honor God, when the Bible said David was a man after God's heart, it wasn't after God's heart like it's like God. David was 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 a man of blood. He couldn't even he wasn't even qualified to build a temple. He was lustful. The Bible said when he was on his deathbed, for his people to know that if he was really dead, the Bible said they put a woman beside him. When the and quote unquote, when the Bible said that when they, when the woman laid beside him and the king never moved. They looked at each other, okay, the king is dead. <laughs> David was lustful. But what he said in his heart, there was a man 
who had his heart after God, it means that he was always in pursuit for God, regardless of his shortcomings. Even when he sinned, he said, cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. David had an honor for God. Joseph in Potiphar's house showed honor to Potiphar. Even when he wasn't there, this is why he didn't sleep with his wife. Imagine if he did. The same God that, that heard the dishonor in Numbers chapter 12 would have saw the sin. And probably, I promise you, believe it or not, I believe Joseph's life would have been different if he'd done that sin. He said, how could I have done this sin against my God? Because Joseph knew God sees. Again, tonight, I want to encourage us that in this cave experience with David, he did not allow people to allow him to be a person of dishonor. And I want to let you know tonight that for your family and within the workplace, be a person of honor. Be a person of honor. I don't. I know this is probably something that, well, I, I didn't really plan to hear this tonight. This is probably the best thing you probably needed to hear tonight. Because you don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. You don't know what anybody's going to present to you. You don't know what your manager or your or people that who work above you may do to you. But the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 13, if we're still going to choose to be Bible-believing people, he says, give honor to whom honor is due. And if they're a manager, honor them. I'm not saying to worship them like God. They're not God. But honor them. Honor them. If you're here and you're listening to this Bible study and discipleship teaching, and you're a son, and you're a daughter, and your parents may do things that may not seem honorable, you still have to honor them. Why? For you, so that your days may be long on earth. You don't want to live long? Let us be a people of honor. Let us be a people of honor. I have learned in my life that I've experienced a lot of bad things in my life. I, there's a lot of things I've, I've, I've shared with my mentor in terms of where I've been betrayed and where I've been hurt. And never there was a time we says, you know what, go get, go, bed, don't worry, go get back at them. We're going to, no. Always told me, take the high road. Take the high road. And I live a blessed life now. I live a blessed life now. I live a blessed life now, I will say. And I choose to be a person of honor. Why? Because I'm a pastor. And I have children. And not because I'm a pastor. You may not be a pastor. But you are a parent. But I know one thing. What the Bible said is true. A seed soweth after its own kind. If I become a person of dishonor. What kind of children would you think I would produce? Because dogs produce dogs. Birds produce birds. If I be a person of dishonor. What type of children would I bring in this world? It's not even my office of a pastor that I choose to live an integral life. It's when I had children, I said I, I didn't want to be the parent that was the hypocrite. You do this and I do that. No. And I get it. My kids know grown folk will do what grown folk do. You're just a child. But in terms of moral and ethics, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So please, tonight, if you want the blessings of God to function in your life, be a person of honor. Honor those who God puts above you. Honor your pastor. This is not a commercial for me. But I will say there's blessings that will come before you. Because when you really check it out in Numbers chapter 12, Aaron and Miriam, they weren't even ridiculing Moses. They were ridiculing his wife. But God took that personal. There was never a time you're reading scripture where God says, I'm going to get from behind this veil. Tell them to come to the tabernacle. I will meet them at the door. You tell the priests don't come to work that day. Because they cannot provide a sacrifice that would save them from that sin. And I'm saying this tonight. So that you can continue to live your best life and be a recipient of every good blessing God would have for you. 
Be a person of honor. Respect people. Respect your children because you're a leader. Respect those that support your vision and your goal. Do not allow people to dictate who you are, who you should be. You can imagine the peer pressure David was speaking. Right there, the opportunity there. And everybody saying, come on, David, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All the whispering, because they obviously they couldn't yell. What do you do when all that whispering is in your ear? You got to hold dear to what you know, what is best and what is right. Be an honorable person as a leader. Be an honorable person as a person that has influence. Because you're a leader, that's great. But there's ethics to this thing. And a leader that doesn't have ethics, we have a title and a name for them in our world. We call you a tyrant. And that's not the type of leadership you want to exhibit. So in your home, don't be a tyrant. Honor your children. Honor your wife. Don't allow any time dishonor and disrespect to frustrate you because you will make your spirit, you will make your vessel attracted to the literal spirit of dishonor. And then when, he, when that spirit comes in, you'll begin to dishonor any and everything. And then the valve of the blessing of God will be shut. It's leprous. You'll be deep, you won't be sensitive to anything of God. Hatred will be inside you. You'd question God. You question the respect and love of others, not knowing that it's a you problem. It's not anybody else. It's a you problem. And then God will begin to isolate you. Not people will begin to believe you. God himself. We're seeing how God deals with it. And then now when the spirit comes up in you, it now has become a stronghold. This is why a stronghold is a mindset with a demonic spirit attached. We're talking about the spirit of dishonor now. There are many strongholds in regards to, you know, low self-esteem. That's a mindset. And if you stay in that mindset so long, you will make your vessel attracted to that spirit. When the disciples were in the upper room, they, when they were, with the Bible, Jesus said, tarry until the Holy Spirit come. What was Jesus trying to say? He's saying, you pray until the environment, when the environment is right, the Holy Spirit will come. Every spirit requires the right environment to function. On our Christian end, it is we function off of one, which trumps all, which is the Holy Spirit. On the demonic side, there are plenty of spirits. And that's another topic. This is not the prayer team impartation. But I thought it was necessary I say that so I can say this. So I could say this. And if you ever want to be a part of those impartations, just send me an email. We can get you involved in that if you want that type of teaching. So you could apply it in your own home and in your own personal life. But in terms of discipleship and leadership, lead from an honorable place. Don't function in dishonor. Don't function in dishonor. Respect people. And you can respectfully rebuke. You don't have to be disrespectful. Just because I said the word rebuke. Rebuke, it doesn't mean you have to be rude. Just re -re rebuke the act, not the person. And say it respectfully. I'm a pastor, I can say anything wrong. You can approach me. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a person. Approach me respectfully. Some of us, we cut off people's hearing because how we approach certain things. And the constructive criticism that you want to provide that could have probably enable the person to do something great, they won't receive it just because how you've done it. You did it in a dishonorable manner. It's not every time you got to do it publicly. Sometimes you got to do it private because it's out of respect you do it. This is one thing I'll close with this. Because when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, Jesus went to go wash his disciples' feet. And I'll close off with this because we've far beyond, gone beyond time. But we're still talking about leadership and functioning from an honorable place so that the blessing of God can flow fluently in my life and we're not isolated outside of the presence of God. 
and from our people. Jesus washed the disciples. Feet. First, Peter didn't want, to do, want him to do it. And Jesus said, what I do right now, you don't understand, Peter. But when you grow up in leadership, you'll understand it. Because if I don't do this, you won't have no part of me. And Peter said that, okay, wash me all over, Jesus. Wash me all over. And Jesus says, you're already clean. But not all of you are clean. Not all of you are clean. Not all of you. Now, when he says that statement, we know who he is speaking to, speaking about. We know who he's speaking to, speaking to Peter. But we know which disciple he is speaking about. But you notice he doesn't single him out publicly. Twice, even when at the last, in the last supper, he doesn't single Judas out and make a public display of it. He says the one that sips, dips at the same thing. He discreetly does it. And if he's talking about that all of you are not all clean, what he could have did to single Judas out was just wash him alone. It's not only serving what he's teaching here. That's one part of the teaching in terms of leadership, where that the leader should serve. But also, he washes all of them. Because sometimes singling people out is not a good practice. If you want to deal with them on an individual basis, set up an individual environment, call a meeting, call them on the phone. Making public displays doesn't show good leadership because your aim is to better the person, not to humiliate the person. You will get your reward if you exercise stuff like that in that fashion. When my children do something wrong, if it's one of them, I don't publicly display them in front of all of them. Sometimes before they go to bed, I go in their room and I talk to that one. Just the same way, if your elbow is scratching, you, you ain't scratching your whole arm. Sometimes you give an injustice to everybody else who don't need to be hearing it. They don't need to be a part of this meeting. They don't need it. You're giving an injustice to everybody else. This is one thing in that, that teaching I've learned when Jesus was washing at the same feet. He doesn't single out. He made it public. He, he made it uniform. It's not good to single out. It's not good. So I'm saying this to say that, even in that regard, in correction, do it in an honorable way. You will get a good result from it. Because if the objective you're doing is to grow the person, you should do it in a healthy way. No gardener stomps on a rose with the intent to make it grow. Amen. So tonight, I want to pray this prayer for you. And I want to pray that you will be a person of honor to those who are above and also those who are below. Those who are above you in the workplace or in ministry, and also those who are below in workplace, in ministry, and even in your own home. When you honor, the blessing of God flows fluently in your life. The day you become a person of dishonor, we see in scripture how God deals with it. And that's not what you want. So just bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today for those that are on this line watching this Bible study, this discipleship teaching. We pray today that we will be people of honor. We will respect we will know now from your scripture that whatever we say and do, when we think it's behind a closed door, you surveil and deal with it yourself because you want all of your children to be children of honor. And everything we do, a child should reflect the tendencies of their father. So we pray today in the name of Jesus, as you honor us as you cared for us. The Bible says, who are men that you are so mindful of us? You honor us as your children. Therefore, we should show the same example of honor 
that even for those that are above and below, knowing that when we show dishonor, it will invite the spirit of dishonor in our life and make us callous and we'll become bitter and empty. That is not the portion you desire for your children tonight. Their life will be filled. They will be possessors of the thing that you have allowed them to dream and see. And they will not allow dishonor to make them abort it because you have called us to be children of honor, children of light. So in this cave experience, we learn that we will not allow people to cause us to become something who you never intended us to be, where you have already anointed David to be a king, despite he's not on the throne. You have already anointed us to be a particular people, a royal priesthood. We will do things in a dignified way with honor. And I believe that as such, as your word declared it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. I hope and pray that this blessing and teaching tonight was a blessing to you. Only good can come from you being a person of honor. If people say good people finish last, it depends on the type of race you're running. Depends on the type of race you're running and what you are competing for. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Take care. God bless.